So let me let me step back a little bit and say what the Lovas local lemma is. I guess that most of the audience has seen it. But let me say uh, what motivates this work. So the lemma is a popular tool in uh, probabilistic combinatorics with applications in computer science as well. And uh, it applies to the following setting. We have some, some space, um, omega, and uh, we would like to prove the existence of some object which has some nice properties. Um, and the properties are, um, are encoded uh, in terms of some bad events that we would like to avoid. We have some events that we think of as bad events, E1 through En on this space. Uh, and we want, we want a point omega that avoids all these events. Um, and this is, this is useful for proving statements with, uh, which have nothing to do with probability, but the probabilistic method is uh, useful for showing that such a point exists. Um, so how, how could we prove that the complement of all the events is non-empty? Well, in some cases, uh, uh, we can prove it, for example, by the union bound. If, if we know that the probability of um, the union of all the events less than one, then clearly there must be something outside. But this is not always the case. And the Lovas local lemma applies in a more refined setting where uh, we don't have this kind of bound of all the events. But we have some bounds on the probabilities of the events and also some information about the dependencies of the events. So, so here's the statement. Um, so we will talk about something called the dependency graph. And then see graph. Uh, which is uh, on a set of vertices that correspond to the events. The dependency graph tells you how the events uh, depend on each other. Um, more precisely, we have the property that for any event EI, the event does not have any dependencies with the non-neighbors of that vertex in the graph. So the event EI is mutually independent of uh, events EJ such that IJ is not an edge in the graph. Is that visible? Is it OK? Can you consider it as a digraph or a? That's a good question. So um, it can be a directed graph. Uh, for some of the results in our uh, paper, you can work with directed graphs. But at some point, we switch to undirected graphs because of uh, some form of dilemma called Shearer's lemma, which works only in the undirected setting. So I think it's better to think of undirected graphs for, for this talk. But some of, some of the results actually work for directed graphs. Yeah, these dependencies are not necessarily symmetric. And um, yeah, I think it's quite clear what it means in the directed sense. The, let's say you take the out neighbors of i, and ei should be mutually independent of those events. So you can, you can consider this as well. Um, so with this notion, the Lovas local lemma says the following. Um, so let me formulate yeah. first. So yes. So whatever conditioning you put on those events, which are non-neighbors of your event, it doesn't affect the probability of EI. Yeah. You can condition on any of them happening, not happening. Doesn't affect. There's actually a relaxation of this that we will also consider later, which is, which is called uh, lopsy dependency. Uh, we will get to that later. Um, so let me formulate um, the, let's call this the general uh, version of the Lovas local lemma. Um, if, if there are some parameters xi between 0 and 1, 
such that the probability of the i is at most x i times the product of 1 minus x j over the neighbors of i, then the probability of avoiding all the events is strictly positive. And actually, you can, you can make a quantitative statement that it's at least the product of 1 minus x i. So these numbers should be strictly between 0 and 1, let's say. Now there's a more uh, restricted symmetric version of this, which is uh, more easily usable in applications, which is that if, uh, if degrees in G are at most D and um, the probability of EI is at most 1 over e times d plus 1 for all i, then uh, the conclusion holds. So this is the, this is the most popular version that people remember. Uh, it's nice because it's almost as if you only had d events. If the dependencies are limited to d neighbors, then it's almost like a union bound on the um, the events. You just lose a factor of e. And there's a natural question here: um, How do you find a point in this uh, intersection of the complements of all these events if you're given an instance um, of a problem where the local lemma guarantees that such a point exists? How do you find it? Um, at this level of stating the problem, it's, it's not really well posed. It's not clear what the computational model here is. Um, in applications, it is usually clear what we are talking about. So let me state, uh, let me state one application, which is a classic application of the, the local lemma. Um, satisfiability, so you have a formula uh, with clauses of size k and have some negations, x7, and some other, some other clause, and so on. Um, so let's say the clauses have size k, uh, a very basic problem in computer science. When is this satisfiable? When can you decide if it's satisfiable? Um, so here's what you can prove using the local lemma. This is a classic example. Um, if each variable appears in at most 2 to the k over ke, I think this is the right formula, clauses, then the formula, let's call it phi is satisfiable. So this is a straightforward application of the symmetric local lemma. And the argument is usually like this. You pick a random assignment. Then you have a bad event, bad event ei, which is that clause i uh, is not satisfied. And what are the dependencies? Well, conservatively, let's say there's a dependency, dependency whenever you share a variable with some other clause. So how many, uh, how many other uh, events can you depend on? Each variable appears in this many clauses. This clause has k variables, so we multiply by k. So d here, actually even d plus 1, is at most 2 to the k over e. As we're counting ourselves as well, the clause itself is counted as well. 
And the probability of these events is uh, 1 over 2 to the k. So that simple. You're not satisfied for exactly one assignment out of 2 to the k. Good. So here, uh, the computational problem is pretty clear what it means. I give you a formula. It satisfies these conditions, and your, uh, your task is to find a satisfying assignment. You know that it exists, but it's not clear how to find it. So there has been a long sequence of works on um, trying to make this kind of problem algorithmic. And um, there have been two eras, essentially. The, the early, early LLL algorithms starting with Josef Beck, uh, Noga Alon also um, had a paper on this, Molloy Reed. So Josef Beck came up with the first approach to find a satisfying assignment under some version of these assumptions. Now the, the early algorithms required uh, stronger assumptions that the Lovas local lemma requires. And the assumptions that were needed for these algorithms to work typically look like this. That if, uh, if each variable appears in, let's say, 2 to the k over 8 clauses, Then, uh, then we can find a satisfying assignment. So this is already very non-trivial. Um, this bound was being pushed uh, gradually, but the real breakthrough came in 2008. Real breakthrough. So this was, of course, a major breakthrough. Robin Moser. No, no, there is so a phenomenon that 10 years is sort of the expiration date. After that, you know, a result is considered trivial and part of the standard textbook. So this was already a breakthrough, right? I don't know what adjective was used at that time. But this was, I, it was not clear how to uh, design any algorithm. Actually, algorithms are not hard to design. It's hard to prove that they work. Right? So, so this was one. Uh, Even that was in the received wisdom. Uh, no, nobody suspected that there's even an algorithm. Right. OK. OK. So in hindsight, the algorithms are extremely simple. And it's what you would do on a computer if you want to. So there have been two breakthroughs here. Uh, the Joseph Beck and uh, Robin Moser came with uh, an extremely slick argument and also a very natural algorithm that I would say somebody would code up on a computer if they really have to solve this problem. They just want to try out something. Maybe that's the algorithm they would try. But there are several different versions of this that you could try. And maybe not all of them work. So, so he proposed the following algorithm. Let, let me just say it in, in the language of this problem. Uh, as long, oh, first uh, just sample random variables. So you start with um, uniformly random uh, variables x1, xm, and then as long 
as there exists a violated clause oh, I you can pick any violated clause if there are multiple ones you can choose your favorite rule uh, resample the variables of, of that clause and yeah, and the repeat so either this terminates and then you're done or it never terminates so the question here is uh, why should this terminate because you have this cascading effect once you fix one clause you cause other clauses to be violated potentially this can blow up well randomly you, you can you can have your favorite tool uh, uh, rule you can say like lexicographically first no, I mean they're ordered so pick the first one you can like an av adversary choose so yeah so this is very robust and and he proved um, of Moser uh, the first result was that this works almost up to the LLL threshold. So uh, in the language of these parameters, if, if the number of occurrences is at most um, 2 to the k minus 5 over k, then this terminates. In, in polynomial time, and polynomial in the size of the uh, uh, formula, number of clauses, let's say. Um, so this is almost all the way up there. There's no longer a multiplicative loss in the exponent. There's still a constant factor loss. Um, the argument was extremely slick to prove this. It was a sort of entropy argument that if the, arg uh, if the, the algorithm doesn't terminate quickly, then you can compress the random bits that the algorithm uses into a smaller number, number of random bits, which would be a contradiction. A very beautiful argument. What's that p minus 5? Well, it's just some constant factor, uh, like 1 over 32 in front of what you would actually like to get. So, so he had this uh, constant slack there that he needed. But very quickly after this, uh, Moser teamed up with Gabor Tardos I think it's still 2008 um, and they really brought it up to the LLL threshold for a very nice general uh, class of problems um, so for this problem uh, let me just say uh, efficiency up to the LLL threshold. And they defined a very nice abstract framework where these algorithms work. So let me say what it is. So the framework is uh, captures a lot of LLL applications. Um, the framework is that you have a space, probability space, which consists of independent random variables. Let's call them x1 through xm. And then you have events defined on top of these variables, events E1 through En, and let's say EI depends only on a subset of these variables. Let's call that subset V sub I. So it's just like that application you have these events and they're limited in terms of what variables they depend on 
and then you uh, define a dependency graph G in a natural way that you look at these sets of variables and you declare them potentially dependent if they share some variables. And Mozart's algorithm has a very natural extension to this setting, which I guess I don't even have to write it down. You do the same thing. You sample random variables. As long as some event uh, is satisfied, you take the variables that uh, determine that event, and you resample those variables. And as long as there's some other event, you continue doing that. And they prove the following, uh, that if, if the probabilities of these events satisfy the LLL conditions, then, uh, then this algorithm uh, terminates after resampling at most following expression, the sum of xi over 1 minus xi um, events in expectation. Let me not write down in expectation, but the statement is in expectation. So the expected running time of your algorithm would be this expression. And you can ask, is this polynomial time? Well, typically, this is a small quantity in, in applications. Uh, of course, there could be applications where xi gets extremely close to 1. So they don't handle those well. But that would be for a natural reason that the probability of the event is actually getting close to 1. And if your only access to the probability space is by sampling these variables, then you would have to wait for a long time even to see that particular event to be fixed. So, so this is a kind of natural expression that you can expect in this setting. And, um, and this is a beautiful result. So um, but what do you base the XI for this unit of kids? Uh, that's, yeah, that's a good question. So the way you get the symmetric LLL from the, the general LLL is that you set XI to be E times the probability of an event. And check that uh, that works. I think that's correct. In, in general, is, is there an, an efficient way to see if such as x size exists? If you give me just the probabilities and the dependencies? Uh, that's a good question. Actually, I'm not sure. No? Is there? I don't know the answer, man, but I know that in applications you, you often struggle with it quite. Yeah, this, so this is the most convenient choice, the symmetric LLL. is kind of, you don't have to make any choices, but sometimes you, you can achieve more with this more general formulation, and then it can be tricky to choose. Um, now usually, this is not an algorithmic problem. This is what you do by hand. So, but, but it's a good question. Like, given a dependency graph and probabilities of these events, can you check if there exists a choice of the? That's your question, right? So actually, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, so these functions are kind of non-convex. Yeah, it's a little bit tricky. Uh, so even in that setting, it's hard to. Um, yeah, I don't know if that makes it easier. Yeah, I simply give you a dependency graph. I tell you what the probabilities are, and you should decide if there exists. Uh, choice of xi. You give the xi's or what? Well, the way we think about it, usually that we are given the xi's. So the like the user already has an existential proof. The user comes, he has an existential proof of a certain statement, so he knows what the xi's should be, and he wants you to provide an algorithm. That's the way we think about it. Okay, so well, so that that is a beautiful, um, pretty general setting. To be fair. This captures 
a ma majority of applications of the Lovas local lemma. So um, if you ask me a few years ago, all I knew about the algorithmic Lovas local lemma is that it's a solved problem. Okay, that's <laughs> that's uh, what my impression was. Um, but there's still um, work to do, and there has been very interesting follow-up work. Uh, so, so what are the directions that that people have pursued? Let me a little bit. There are several features of um, the moser tardosh framework, which um, can be improved potentially. Um, so let me just summarize what the research directions beyond moser tardosh have been. So um, you can ask about the randomization of this algorithm. It's still a randomized algorithm. It has been derandomized for some more restrictive settings. It's not quite, doesn't capture the full general, generality of what I described there. So I'm not going to talk about the randomization today. Uh, parallel algorithms. I'm also not going to talk about parallel algorithms. Uh, what I'm uh, interested in here is going beyond this independent random variable setting to more general. Broadly speaking, uh, this is open. There are results, but they don't go all the way up to the, okay. the generality of what we know. In the back framework, it can be yeah, so if you have that kind of slack, let's say this, this would be, yeah, this would be known by now. Uh, you can go, almost, already Mozart Tardos had a, a deterministic version, which only requires some little constant slack here, one minus epsilon. But you also need the degrees in the graph to be constant, uh, bounded by constant. So, so there are some additional restrictions. Yeah. Um, well, the primary point of this talk is to talk about more general probability spaces than the Mozart Tardos set up, and also uh, stronger, stronger versions. Quantitatively speaking, of the LLL. So what I mean by that is that the uh, LLL assumptions are a sufficient uh, condition for the conclusion to hold, but it's not the best condition that you can formulate. And there are stronger versions which are known, so I will talk about that a little bit in the second hour. Uh, but really, the main main goal here is the following question. Uh, well, I, I can formulate it in a bold way. Like, is it true that for any any application of the Lovas local lemma, there exists an efficient algorithm? Now, if you ask it that way, it doesn't really make sense because you can make up some. Uh, bogus applications that are hard for a trivial reason. Um, but so I will, um, OK, so you could have like a completely um, um, you know, unfair argument that I could make was that you have a probability space which has one event, the probability space like 0, 1. The, the instance is determined by uh, formula phi. And the event is defined, tells you 0 or 1, depending on whether the formula is satisfiable. Something like that. If you, you, know, if you call that, so the event is either 0 or 1, depending on uh, if the given formula is satisfiable. Well, OK, it's, uh, it depends how the instance is given to you. This is only for the purpose of saying that if you don't formulate the problem in a reasonable way, you know, there's something in the complement of this event by the LLL, because the probability is 1 half. The dependency graph is trivial. So you, know, you have to be careful what you, 
what you ask for. That's an I think creating applications where you just cannot check, given a, a point in the sample space, you cannot check if uh, efficiently if it satisfies. Uh, so that's a, Ramsey, yes. Uh, some Ramsey numbers, for example, and the best known bounds for Ramsey number R for K. Right. So that's another step towards a more reasonable uh, goal. Let's say that we can check efficiently for a given point in the space whether uh, it satisfies a given event or not. But even in that setting, it could still be hard. So actually, I was planning to do that later, but since the question came up. Um, so here's an argument that the problem could be computationally hard. Um, Even, even if we satisfy uh, several reasonable conditions. So we can sample from omega. Uh, let's say it's efficient. Let's say we can check whether a given state, uh, I call these states. Omega is a point in the probability space, but uh, we usually call them states. Um, so this is also efficient. Uh, you know, I give you the dependency graph. The LL conditions are satisfied. these parameters are given. So this sounds like I'm giving you several reasonable assumptions um, that might make the, the task doable. The number of EI is now is, is part of the inputs. So the number of EI is Yes. Let's say uh, we have n events, and we want to be polynomial in n. So, so here's an argument why it's impossible, even in this setting. Let me erase this. OK, so, so let's say the space is. Uh, 0, 1 to the n, uh, which is kind of like the mozart tardor setting. And I define events on this uh, space, which will be actually independent. And each of them has probability 1 half. So the LL conditions are satisfied. And uh, the events are defined as follows. So let's take function f. is a one-way permutation. For example, exponentiation in the gf 2 to the n. Let's say g is a generator. This would be a function that um, is hard to invert. And I define ei. Oh, and you're also given some special point. Let's call it z. Now it's simple. Again, it, there's nothing deep happening here, but it's, it's an illustration of what we should be careful about. So the event ei is a set of points such that when I. Uh, sorry? I don't, I don't know it. I can't prove it. I, think this is believed. Okay. Is it hard to invert this? If you don't believe that, you shouldn't use <laughs> discrete log. Discrete log, yeah. Uh, discrete log, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, this yeah, is not. How do you invert? Uh, is that proven? I don't think it's proven. Yeah, it's, uh, that's a cryptographic assumption. So it's so not. It's important content to prove that P is not MP, right? So, so you're not going to prove it, but it's P, right? 
it's not in the realm of like NP completeness. This is uh, bijection. You want to invert it, but it's one of the basic assumptions. So good. So uh, now you can already guess what, what I'm doing here. I'm uh, basically just uh, shuffling up the, the Boolean cube in a way that uh, makes it hard to find one particular point. So the event EI would be looking at the ith coordinate of the outcome of this function. And I'm checking against this uh, unknown, uh, I mean, this target point z. Um, so now, if you can find omega, which avoids all these events, then, then you compute f inverse of z, right? So this is very simple, right? It, uh, it only il illustrates that. Uh, what does it illustrate? That it's not enough just to be able to check whether the event is satisfied. You also need something about the start events that allow you, in some sense, to go between them in some efficient way. Um, is this clear? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, So, OK, this was a digression. Um, I was actually in the middle of talking about some follow-up work uh, after Mozart Tardos. So there was quite a bit of work. Let me mention uh, several papers that are relevant to what we are doing here. So, so one uh, result by Kolipaka Segedi. Uh, was an extension of the Moser-Tardos framework to the ultimate form of the local lemma, in some sense, which is called Shearer's lemma. So I will formulate Shearer's lemma a little bit later. Uh, what Shearer's lemma tells you is uh, the if and only if condition on being able to avoid all the events simultaneously. It's a condition such that if it's satisfied, then the complement is non-empty. And if it's violated, then there exists an arrangement of events such that they cover the entire space. So, so that's uh, the ultimate form. Uh, it's actually not a very practical form of the local lemma, but it's nice theoretically. Um, now, in terms of, but that, that's still in the Moser Tardos framework. So that's still about independent random variables. In terms of going beyond that, the first setting uh, that doesn't fall within the Moser Tardos framework, which was made algorithmic and quite recently, was by Harrison Srinivasan, who uh, made the LLL algorithmic for uh, for random permutations. So that's another natural setting where omega is the, the symmetric group. And let's say you have uniform measure on it. So you, you have uniformly random permutations. And there are LLL uh, applications that use this kind of setting. Um, let me just say Latin transversals. That's. Uh, the canonical application here, and that's what they made algorithmic. Uh, let me skip the details of that because I'm running a little bit late. Let me just say that this was technically very complicated. While the, the Mozart Tardos framework is extremely clean and like you can teach it in one hour or two hours, this gets very complicated. It's not clear if it's necessary, but they basically lift the tools of Mozart Tardos to this setting, and it gets really technical because of the depend because of these you know, dependencies between uh, 
where different elements are mapped in a random permutation. So that gets pretty technical. And then there was a, uh, a recent paper by Akliuptas Iliopoulos which for one thing makes this application easier. They have a much more manageable proof of uh, the analysis for Latin transversals and for applications with per permutations. Um, they formulate an abstract what they call flaw correcting framework which is very interesting and it captures several applications that they show. They show how to uh, find efficiently uh, rainbow matchings under the LLL assumptions essentially rainbow Hamiltonian cycles So the framework seems to be very much related to the LLL, but from their paper, it's not actually clear how exactly it's related. So I think what's fair to say is that there is some uh, intuitive connection that allows you to use this framework to capture many applications of, of the LLL. Uh, for example, it's not clear if this framework subsumes the Moser-Tardos framework. It's not clear how, how these are related. Uh, and in terms of trying to find an algorithmic proof of the local lemma, th this paper doesn't really do that because they don't show how their framework can be constructed given that the LLL conditions are satisfied. I, I could discuss that further. Let me maybe postpone it a little bit until we see how our framework works and then, then I can compare. Uh, but I would say that the main thing that for us seems to be missing in this work is that it's not explicitly connected to the probabilistic local lemma. They actually start from a clean slate and they define their own framework, which in some ways seems to go beyond the probabilistic lemma, uh, but doesn't seem to capture some applications. Now, uh, so in terms of applications, let me say that at this point, it's pretty hard to find an application of the low loss local lemma that has not been made algorithmic, OK? So the question is, what are we doing here? Um, what we really want to find is a general proof that works for any application under some reasonable assumptions. Um, but if you want a new application setting, here, here is one. Uh, it's not the primary application, uh, the motivation for us, but it's a setting that has not been captured so far, as far as we know. So this is the setting of random uh, spanning trees. And uh, this is a setting that has been studied recently by Lou Moore and Seke. And it's the following kind of setup that you have omega that consists of spanning trees in the complete graph. So you could say all trees on labeled trees on and vertices. And then you consider events of the following type. E A is the event that A is contained in T. T is a tree. So the events that we are interested in here is that we take some set of edges, let's call it A, and we're talking about random trees. And the event is that this set of edges is contained in the tree. So these would be events that we would like to avoid, or some, some events of this type. This is a general setting. Um, and we actually have um, an application, which I will show in a minute. Let me say what the dependencies are here, because that actually turns out to be very nice. Um, so the dependency graph is that A, B is an edge if 
these two sets of edges are not vertex disjoint. So these are sets of edges. <coughs> and you take all the endpoints, right? Yes, all the endpoints, sets of edges. So these would be, yeah, this would be the union of edges in A. So this is actually an interesting fact that um, I'm not sure if it's widely known, but in a complete graph, if I take a random tree and I look at two vertex disjoint sets of edges, could be anything, then the appearance of A and the appearance of B is independent. In a general graph, this is not true. Actually, the, the appearance of different edges is negatively correlated. But in a complete graph, this is true. And um, so this was pointed out by Lou Moran Seke. Um, they didn't actually prove any, any specific application for this, but, uh, but we show one. And uh, let me say what it is. The interesting point is that you don't even need lopsidedness for this. These are actually independent. The, uh, the problem is that it actually goes the other way. So for lopsidedness, you need to be positively correlated with your non-neighbors. And this would go the other way. You would be negatively correlated with non-neighbors. But that's not really useful. Yeah. So unfortunately, in a, in a general graph, this doesn't seem to work nicely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, given the time, let me, let me just say what can be proved. Um, and literally, we made up this application to have something that we can make al algorithmic. Yeah, I'm open about it. So this is a statement. First, let me state actually a conjecture, a nice conjecture. Um, So this is, um, let me call it the rain, rainbow spanning tree conjecture. Which was formulated by Brualdi and Hollingsworth. So this is uh, a quite an appealing conjecture. Conjecture is that for any edge coloring proper edge coloring, which means that incident edges have different colors of um, k n n at least six even with n minus 1 colors, which is the best you can hope for because you have n minus 1 neighbors, and the, the edges should all have different colors, there exists a decomposition of the edges of the complete graph into n over 2 edge disjoint Spanning trees. Uh, yeah. Oh, rainbow spanning trees. Yes. Did you define that rainbow? So I didn't. So rainbow means uh, each edge in um, in the tree has a different color. So this would be very nice because everything would just work out perfectly. You have n over 2 disjoint spanning trees, which can be found. Um, and each of them would use each color exactly once. So each color would be used exactly once in each tree. Everything just works out perfectly. 
maybe this is too good to be true. And for a long time, not much was known. So actually, in the uh, I, so I I don't think it works for odd n just because of some parity issue. Uh, but for even yeah, so for four, okay. So I actually <laughs> tried to prepare an example for this talk, and I so I started with k four, right? And you so you do this, <laughs> you have uh, coloring. Let me do that in one minute. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and also like you would like to decompose into n over two, so the numbers don't work out. So here's k four. This is an edge coloring of four, and you try to find two edge disjoint uh, rainbow spanning trees. Uh, it doesn't work out, right? Because one choice for a spanning tree is this. The only rainbow spanning tree is actually this. And then the complement would be a cycle. So, so, oh, what's happening here? But the conjecture has n at least equal to 6. And it's for some small values. Um, so what is actually known? For a long time, it was only known that under these assumptions, two trees exist. Then this was improved to three trees. Uh, and very recently, Carraher uh, et al showed that uh, roughly n over log n rainbow spanning trees can be found. Um, so what can be proved using the local lemma? We proved the following. Um, it's inco incomparable to this statement. Using the local lemma, you can prove that if each color appears at most and over a hundred times, then there exists an over a hundred. Uh, doesn't have to be proper. And actually, we will need more colors than n. Because, well, just because of the counting, each color appears n over 100 times, so you will need like 100 n colors. But if that's the case, then you can find a linear number of disjoint rainbow spanning trees. And um, that can be proved using. Uh, using the setting that I outlined there. So I'll leave it as an exercise. It's not too hard. Um, it illustrates how nicely the low-vast local lemma works, because the, the argument is that you take n over 100 independently random spanning trees, and you hope that they will be all uh, pairwise disjoint and rainbow at the same time. So how can this be? How likely are you? Each color appears on at most yeah, uh, yeah, at most. Let me say on at most n over 100 edges. So rainbow now, what, what does it mean to be a rainbow? The rainbow means that each edge has a different color, but it doesn't mean that you use all the colors. Yeah, you cannot use all the colors because you have more than n. So yeah, so this makes it easier, of course. Uh, I think this was not known or was not stated anywhere. It's it's an application of the Lovas local lemma. So this is this is a statement that we can make algorithmic. If you want a concrete statement a yes there's a similar conjecture for rainbow matchings and uh, I think it's mm, I think it's not known for uh, rainbow I matchings either. But oh, you can do exactly the same thing for rainbow matchings. That's true. Yes, you can prove exactly the same statement for rainbow matchings. There's so you have a paper uh, about Latin Latin transversals, which is uh, which implies that. Which shows actually more. Uh, you show that if you if each color appears 
epsilon n times for some tiny epsilon, then you can decompose everything into rainbow matchings. Yeah. So it's stronger. Yeah. So yeah, we don't have that kind of statement for so trees. Yeah, we uh, we haven't done it. It looks like maybe it's doable using your techniques, but it's more complicated. And also the statement that you mentioned, your, your paper, I think that has not been made algorithmic. This is epsilon n decomposition into rainbow matchings. I think that's still not clear, but yeah. There seems to be more in that paper than just uh, one clean application of the OWASP local one. Um, so, well, I finished up the first hour, uh, and I haven't stated our main result. So either we can take a break now, or I can. You can take a break whenever you want. So if, if you prefer to stay to the time. Yeah. Let me. Yeah, so maybe 10 minutes, I will just state what our framework is and what the main result is. And then you can decide if you, can, if you want to see the proof or not. So, so here's our framework. So, uh, so we have three assumptions, uh, three algorithmic assumptions. First, um, we can sample from, let me call it mu. So mu is some probability distribution on the probability space. That's the basic distribution that we work with. And other distributions will arise in the course of the algorithm, but this is like, this would be uniform, let's say, in that application. That's the default probability distribution. The second assumption is that we can check whether a given point satisfies a certain event. So that's, that's natural. As we saw, that's still not enough. So here's a third assumption that we have, and that is that we have access to something called resampling oracles. So the resampling oracles uh, generalize uh, the notion of resampling that Moser and Tardos used in their algorithm, um, we have one resampling oracle for each event. And the resampling oracle does the following. Uh, uh, it takes a point in the space. It outputs some other point in the space. And this could be a randomized transition. Typically, this should be tra randomized. So uh, the, the oracle injects some randomness of its own. And it satisfies the following two conditions. That if I take, if I take a state that's distributed according to mu conditioned on EI, I hope it's clear what that means. It's, uh, you take a point sampled from mu, but you condition on being inside the event that you're trying to resample, then ri of omega is distributed according to mu. So the oracle removes conditioning on ei. And that's exactly what the moser tardos operation does, because it refreshes the variables that define that event, and it doesn't do anything to the other variables. And the second condition is that if, um, let me say it in words first, the condition is that you cannot cause non-neighbor events. By executing the oracle, you should never create, a cause a new event to occur unless that event is your neighbor in, in the dependency graph. So if currently you are not in EJ and ij is not an edge, so I'm resampling this event ei. It has some neighbors. But then the stuff out there, whether they were satisfied or not, I should not cause a new event here to be satisfied. So 
with probability one. So this is. There's uh, only one way. Maybe. Both that's both true. Ways. That's true. With. Yes. So let me just. You know, so that's a good point. I am allowed to accidentally fix an event which is outside of the neighborhood. That is allowed. And that is actually necessary to handle uh, those lopsided applications of the LLL. This will become more clear later. But this kind of uh, change is allowed. I'm not allowed to cause a new event to happen if it's not related to me. And uh, let me just state, oh, let me state what the algorithm is. So the algorithm is quite similar to the moser tardosh algorithm, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, so we call this the maximal set resample algorithm. And let me first say pictorially how it works. Uh, so we try to fix events which are satisfied. We find events uh, that are satisfied, but we do that in a particular order. We start, let's say they're ordered uh, 1, 2 through n. So we find the first event that's uh, satisfied. We resample that. Then we ignore its neighbors. We go to the next event which is satisfied, which is not a neighbor of what we resampled already. We will resample that. Again, we take out its neighbors. So we go on like this, resampling events that form an independent set in the graph. And that will be important, particularly for this shear uh, version of the lemma. But it's actually useful even for uh, the basic LLL version. So we resample these events in a way that makes the resampled set an independent set in G. And once you're finished, there are no more uh, events to work with, then you check, was everything fixed or not? And if not, then you repeat the whole thing. OK, let me write it down. Maybe that was already clear, but let me write it down. So you start with omega sampled according to mu, and then repeat. So you build this independent set j that starts out empty and for the events in some fixed order if omega satisfies an event and e is not in the neighborhood of what you resampled already in this phase let me call it Gamma of J would be all the uh, all the neighbors of J. I is not yes. Thank you. So if I is not a neighbor of what we resampled so far, then uh, then we resample and add this element to j. So we do this in phases until j is empty. So j is this uh, independent set that we are building in this particular phase. These would be the vertices of j that we include one by one. So it's useful that this will be uh, an independent set. Well, so uh, J doesn't have to contain all the events. Uh, maybe you're asking, why are we done if this terminates? <coughs> or you have So, um, okay. Okay. 
Um, So we use we use that property here. So uh, if we resample an element, we cannot cause a new neighbor to uh, to hold. Yes. Okay. The stopping condition is until no event told. Okay. 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 Okay, that's better. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. Now, now it's true that when we terminate, then we're done. Yes. OK, so let me just uh, formulate the main result. Uh, so with those assumptions that we have access to these procedures, if, if the probability of the i is at most xi times uh, the usual expression that we have in the LL um, statement, then maximal set resample terminates in big O of sum of xi over 1 minus xi squared expected uh, steps. By step, I mean a resampling, call to a resampling oracle. So we have this square here, which is uh, a little bit strange. Uh, so I think it's, good, it's a good time to take a break. Uh, this is the square of the running time that Moser Tardosh proved. Each step is one. Yes. So let me say resampling operations. Yeah. Yeah, no, not the big phases, but yeah, the resampling operations. Um, so, so we are doing stuff a little bit differently than Moser Tardosh. In some ways, the analysis is weaker. And uh, we actually have to do quite a bit of work to get an expression that is efficient up to the tight LLL conditions. Uh, what I will show in the next hour is a proof under slightly more restrictive condition that you have 1 minus epsilon here. That will be actually quite quick, quite simple. To get this result, we have to work a little bit harder, and we have to go through the shearer form of the lemma, which, uh, which is more powerful. Um, but the bottom line is that we recovered the moser tardosh result up to the quadratic blow up in the running time. So let's take a break, five minutes, maybe. Um, so, um, so my goal now is to show you the analysis for a slightly more restricted uh, assumption, which is that the probability of EI is at most 1 minus epsilon times this. And the running time will depend on 1 over epsilon, so it seems as if it blows up as we approach the tight uh, LLL condition. And then we show that that's actually not the case. But um, I will not have time to do that. Uh, before I get to the proof, let me, uh, let me say one more thing, which is why, why is this actually uh, proof, not even algorithmic, but why is, why is it considered uh, proof of uh, the Lovas local lemma? Right? What, what is the connection? between the resampling oracles and, uh, and the LLL assumptions. So there is a connection, which is this. Let me just state it. It's not hard to prove. Uh, what this uh, connection proves is actually 
a certain form of the Lovas local lemma, which is a little bit more general than what I stated so far, but it's not as general as what is known as the lopsided LLM, which is uh, it's an interesting point. There's something happening there that requires us to assume a little bit more. So the question here uh, is, when do these resampling oracles exist? So the statement is that a resampling oracle Ri exists if uh, well, recall that we are talking about some event EI. It has some neighbors. Let's call this set gamma plus of I, the inclusive neighborhood of I. And then we have some events out there which are uh, not supposed to be dependent. Um, the statement is that this uh, resampling oracle exists if for any event f that depends monotonically on dj, j not in the neighborhood, so the non-neighbor events, any events that is allowed to depend on the events outside of i, but only in a monotonically non-decreasing way, we have the following correlation that probability of EI conditioned of, on F is at least the probability of EI. So, so certainly the resampling oracle exists if EI is entirely independent of those events. I'm saying here that we can allow a little bit more. There can be some kind of positive correlation between those events and the non-neighbor events. What I mean, actually, is it clear what I mean by depends monotonically? The, the indicator random variable of f is a, it's a Boolean function of the indicator random variables of these events, and it's a non-decreasing function. So if for any such event f you have positive correlation, then the resampling oracle Ri exists, and that's exactly what characterizes. And le let me just say that this follows from uh, max flow min cut kind of argument, which I'm going to skip. It's not too complicated. Uh, let me just say one more thing. For, for those who are familiar with uh, the lopsided LLL, let me contrast this with an assumption which is actually enough to prove the existential uh, LLL. The lopsided version has the following kind of assumption that for any set J of non-neighboring events, let me state it like this. This is not the way it's usually stated, but this is equivalent. Um, so if you condition on the union of a bunch of events which are not neighbors of your event, then this can only increase the probability of EI. Uh, Noga, do you recognize this as a, it's usually stated in a, the complementary, in the complement, uh, which is equivalent, and I'm just writing it this way because this this is one possible choice for, for my event f here. This is one possibility uh, of an event which depends monotonically on the non-neighbor events, which is take a bunch of those events and take their union. That's one possibility. So you need a bit more. So we need a bit more. So we don't quite know why that's the case. But existentially, the form of the Lovas local lemma that we can prove is under this assumption which doesn't require true independence, but it requires this kind of uh, what we call lopsided association. Why lopsided association? It's a little bit reminiscent of 
positive association between variables. Like you can put any monotone function on a bunch of variables and a bunch of other variables, and these two functions should be positively correlated. So it's a little bit similar to what's happening here, except we have one event versus some monotonic function of the non-neighboring non events. Um, I think that's all I want to say about the... Wait, the uh, in this well, formulation, it's a zero-one function. You might as well say any monotonic function, but it, like then, then you would have to talk about. Yeah, you would have to formulate it a little bit differently. Depends. It depends only on. Good point. Good point. Depends only on these. And the dependence is monotonic. Is it, maybe that's more clear. Okay. Um, good. So, um, so this is the characterization of. Uh, of the existential statement where our framework applies. Now, we don't claim that any application in that setting can be made algorithmic. And that's exactly because of the issue that arises in, in the one example. The issue is that these resampling oracles are guaranteed to exist, but you also have to implement them efficiently. So that's another thing you have to do as a user of this framework, and effectively, the whole thing is a reduction of the problem of finding a point outside of all the events to the problem of designing these resampling oracles. So we show that it's enough to design these, and that's um, something that we can actually do in, in all the settings that are known. Um, actually, let me say, yes, let me say one more thing. How do you design the resampling oracle in the setting of spanning trees? It's a nice uh, exercise. Resampling oracle for spanning trees. So let me, let me recap what are we supposed to do. We have a uniformly random, random tree T conditioned on containing a certain set of edges. Okay, so we have this particular set of edges which defines the event that we are talking about. Now I take a random tree uniformly conditioned on containing this. Not containing. Containing. So the no. e event. Yeah, so I'm trying to fix. These are bad events, and I'm trying to fix. That's what the resampling oracle does. It, it takes some state which uh, I'm trying to satisfy now the first condition. I take a state which is conditioned on satisfying the event, and I'm supposed to reshuffle things in a way that produ produces a uniformly random tree. But also, I have to satisfy the second condition is that. I, which is that I should not cause any event uh, which is not a neighbor of this. So I should not cause anything that's vertex disjoint from A. How can you do that? Uh, it's a little puzzle. So let me just say it in words. So let's look at the vertices covered by A and look at the complement. So on the complement, there might be some edges here that the tree already has. And we are not going to touch those, because we should not cause any new events in the complement, in the vertex complement. So we fix, we fix all the edges that we already have here. Fix the edges. And also the non edges. So, whatever the tree is doing in the complement, we will keep it there. We will not touch it.
and we generate a uniformly random tree conditioned on let me just say conditioned on whatever is happening in the complement complement v minus w we just keep it there edges and non edges everything stays the same and condition on that we generate a uniformly random tree that can be done because you can contract those edges delete the non edges and you generate a uniformly random tree in the resulting graph and the claim is that this will be a uniformly random tree overall and why is that? Well, that's because of the independence properties of random spanning trees. It's because conditioning on A did not affect the distribution of what we see in the complement. So what we see here, if you close your eyes, you don't look at this side of the graph. What you see here is exactly what you would see in a uniformly random tree. So the distribution here is already correct. And if you fix that and uniformly generate the rest, that will actually produce a uniformly random spanning tree. Uh, so you, you prove that by uh, some tree counting formulas, like an extension really extension of the Cayley formula. Yeah, yeah. you have to compute some. And it's not completely uh, obvious. It's quite, I'm, I didn't know about it. I don't know if it's like a standard fact or, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, good. So. So that's why we can handle spanning trees. That's all you have to do. And you pl plug it in here, and that's, um, that's how it works. Let me keep the algorithm just for a second. So now, now I'm going to talk about the analysis. I have almost half an hour. So the goal is to do the analysis if probability of EI is at most 1 minus epsilon times the expression from the LLL. And uh, for five minutes, let me muse a little bit about the differences between how we do things and how Mozart Tardosh do things. So. Um, let me talk about forward versus backward analysis. So the moser tardosh analysis is extremely slick. And it, it uses the following kind of uh, argument. What they really bound uh, is the probability that a certain structure exists in in how the algorithm resamples the events, something co they call a witness tree. And the witness tree is a structure that, that certifies why a certain event EI was resampled at some point in the future. So time goes like this. And I'm not going to say exactly how they bound this probability. But the analysis is about these structures. It's about trees that contain a root corresponding to some event EI, which is sort of in the future. And then you go back and you connect all the events that preceded the resampling of EI. And if you have an edge in the tree, then these two events are dependent in the graph. They build this structure going backwards in time. And then they say, what is the probability that this particular structure has appeared during the runtime of the algorithm? They have this witness tree lemma, which is a crucial um, tool, which says that the probability, let me state it informally, the probability that this kind of witness tree appears is at most the product of all the events. Let me just use the following notation, pi, the probability of event i. It's just a product of the probabilities of the events that are sitting on the vertices of this tree. So this is a crucial tool in Moser Tardosh. And it's a tool that we don't have. So actually, we proved that the witness tree lemma is false 
in the general framework that we outlined here. So the analysis doesn't quite go like this. What we use is uh, what we call forward analysis. And I would say that forward analysis is actually uh, it's less tricky. It's, it's more like uh, what you would try to do first. But the problem with the forward analysis is that it doesn't give bounds as good as mozart tardosh So what is forward analysis? We analyze trees which are very similar to this, but they grow forward in time. So what are the trees, or rather forests, that we analyze? Time goes like this. And, and the trees are constructed by just writing down the events that we resampled. And then later, when we resample something that was caused by resampling a previous event, then we connect it like this. So it looks very similar, but our trees grow forward in time. What is the difference? There seems to be very little difference. The, the adjacency properties are basically the same. We also have a bound very similar to this, but the main difference is that we don't start from a single root. We start from a collection of events that were satisfied at the beginning. So you have to count forests instead of trees. And that makes the bounds much worse than what you have in mozart -Ardosh. So at first sight, it looks like this leads to exponential bounds. Um, at a high level, what we do in the first step is that if you have, if you have an epsilon slack, then that's actually enough to make these bounds polynomial. So that's not too hard. Uh, to prove the result under tight LL conditions, we have to do quite a bit of more work, which involves, which involves Shearer's lemma. And what we prove there, essentially, that there's always some slack. There's always some slack in the LL conditions because you have this shear bound, which is strictly better. And shear's bound actually defines an open set, while the LL conditions define a closed set. So there's always some space between the LL conditions and shear's conditions. And we quantify how much that slack is. So I, I won't have time to talk about that. But let me just say that we prove this automatic slack, which makes the bounds polynomial even in that case. So that's a little bit more tricky. Um, so now, what if, he, what if we have some slack? I will just assume that there's some slack in the conditions. So we will consider um, the following sequences. Um, we will say that the algorithm resamples i1, i2, da da da, if, um, you know, if in the first t phases, uh, these are the sets resampled in the first t phases. Um, there could be more stuff that the algorithm resampled afterwards, but we just say that the algorithm resampled these sets if that was the prefix of what happened. Um, so what can we say about this sequence? Um, the first fact is that for every time s, the set 
in the next step is contained in the inclusive neighborhood of the previous set. Why is that? Because we resampled a maximal independent set of satisfied events. There might have been some other events that we did not resample. Let's say this is the set that we resampled. There are some neighbors that we skipped. We postpone them basically to the next iteration. So those could be possibly violated, satisfied. And there could also be some events that we caused by resampling these guys. But again, those must be neighbors of what we resampled. Or potentially, we could have the same event that we resampled in the previous step. It could be still violated now. So in any case, all the events that we have to consider in the next phase are in the neighborhood of the set in the previous. Um, so, so we have these sequences that we call stable set sequences. And this is not a new definition. This was actually used in Kalipaka Segedi. Um, now, the interesting point is that in Kalipaka Segedi, in those uh, stable set sequences grow backwards in time. That's the paper that extended Mozart Tardos to the shearer setting. So they have these sequences that grow backwards in time. We use very similar sequences, but forward in time. So this is any sequence such that i s plus 1 is contained in the neighborhood of the previous set. Um, so the question here is how do we account for all the possible sequences that we could resample, and what is the probability of resampling them? How can we bound that? So the first lemma, <coughs> the first lemma the first lemma is that the probability that the algorithm resamples I1 through i t is at most the product of the probabilities of all the events that appear in those sets. Let me use a shorthand notation. Let me denote this p to the i s. Why is this true? So this is true by um, by coupling lemma by um, which is kind of similar to a, <coughs> one argument in Moser Tardos, but again, it's forward in time instead of backward. So, what is the proof of this? So, given uh, sequence. Let's fix a sequence. Let's define, let's call it script i. Uh, let's consider the following i checking process. Uh, the i checking process simply goes through the events in these sets one by one. It checks that each event is satisfied when we come to it, and it will resample the event. It doesn't look at any other events, which is different from what the algorithm does. This process simply checks and resamples uh, the event in, in the union in the order that the algorithm would have considered them uh, and succeed uh, well, let me say it will fail, fail if at any point uh, an event 
is not satisfied. Um, okay, so again, this is a blind checking process. I'm only checking the events that I have in these sets. What is the probability that this checking process succeeds? It's exactly that product, right? Because at the beginning, I'm in probability distribution mu, I check the first event. The probability that it's satisfied is exactly pi, whatever that event is. Conditioned on that, I'm in mu conditioned on ei. So I'm going to resample, and I'm back in mu. Is that convincing? I would prefer to skip, uh, skip the formal details of that. So the probability is exactly the product of all these probabilities. And the second claim is that the probability that the algorithm resamples those sets in order is at most the probability that the eye checking succeeds. And that's because uh, if you run the two processes and you feed them the same source of randomness, whenever the algorithm resamples these events, uh, the eye checking process would also succeed. The algorithm is also checking some other stuff on the side. So there might be points where these two processes diverge. But certainly, if the algorithm follows this path, then the checking process also succeeds. Because those are the only events that the algorithm resamples. It checks some other stuff on the side, but doesn't resample those. So yeah. Um, So that's the first lemma. Now, <clears throat> now the analysis is all about summing up over these sequences of sets. So what can we say about the following kind of the following kind of summation? Let's sum up over all sequences uh, stab, let me call it stab t, stable set sequences of uh, length t. We sum up these products. Um, well, what is the bound that we can prove of, on this? We can prove the following bound, which is unfortunately pretty bad. So you can prove the following. This summation for any p, it doesn't go to infinity, but it's bounded by the following expression. The product of 1 over 1 minus xi. So note that this is actually exactly 1 over the lower bound on the probability of avoiding all the events. So it looks as if we are not getting anywhere. Hopefully, I can show why this is true. But let me just say that if we have a slack, if the probability of the i uh, is at most 1 minus epsilon times what the local lemma would tell you, then we would be actually fine. So the, the bound above is true even for conditions. That bound is true without any epsilon. So if we can just throw in some little epsilon that we are uh, slightly below the tight bound, uh, then things would actually be fine. Uh, relatively fine, in the sense that the probability that we resample at least, uh, let's say, L events would be at most 1 minus epsilon to the L times this product.
Why is that true? Well, because uh, we execute the same analysis, but we have this additional 1 minus epsilon that we accumulate every time we resample an event. Um, the bound above w works for probabilities that satisfy this condition potentially with equality. So, so we get this 1 minus epsilon to the L, which uh, if we choose L large enough, it will, be, it will kill the exponential. So, so we choose L 1 over epsilon uh, log the product, let's say, plus some t. This is enough to make the probability of resampling at least L events to make it very small. Right? So, so this assumption actually makes the analysis much easier. Um, let me just massage this expression a little bit more. Uh, L is at most, let's say the expected, the expected number of resamplings is at most uh, big O of 1 over epsilon log of the product, which is sum of the log of 1 minus 1 over 1 minus xi. And just to relate to Moser Tardosh, this is always at most 1 over epsilon times the sum of xi over 1 minus xi. Now this, this is simple inequality. So, so this kind of analysis shows that if you have epsilon slack, then your running time is at most 1 over epsilon times what the running time of Moser Tardosh was. So that's, that's already not so bad. As I mentioned, it can be improved, but I won't get to do that. In the remaining five minutes, I'm hoping to prove the bound up there. OK, so we prove it by induction. The inductive statement. <coughs> inductive statement is that summation over all independent sets that start from a fixed set J let me this tab LJ are all the sets um, where the first set is J. So fixing the first set in the summation, we sum up over all sequences of this type. And the claim is that this is at most the product over I and J of Xi over 1 minus Xi. Slightly different statement. Uh, the proof of this statement will actually also make it clear why, why it implies that. So let me prove this. Uh, the base case, what do we have in the base case? The base case is that p to the j, which means product of pi over j, is at most the product of x i over 1 minus x i over j. So that's clearly true, because uh, certainly p i is at most x i. That's, that's true by the assumptions. So the base case is OK. Now the inductive step, let's look at So let's look at sequences of length t plus 1.
let me actually make it I0 through IT. So we look at these expressions, and we unroll uh, the summation uh, one step ahead. So um, the first step, the first step must be p to the j, right? So we certainly get p to the j. In the next step, we could possibly have some set which is in the neighborhood of j. It should also be independent, but for now, actually, we don't need that. So let me forget about it. Um, so it will be, at most, summation over all subsets of the neighborhood. Uh, and summation over sequences. Well, for now, let me keep it just to, to stay in the realm of uh, stable set sequences. Um, so now we sum up over stable set sequences of length t that start from L, correct? Um, and again, we have this big product. So now, by the inductive hypothesis, we have a bound on this. Right? This is uh, over all sequences of length t. So we can say that this is at most p to the j times summation over subsets L of gamma plus of j. Um, of this expression that we claim uh, to be the bound. OK. Um, so, so this can be rewritten as follows. It's a product over all elements of gamma plus j of 1 plus xi minus xi. A little trick is that clear that this product contains terms for each subset of, of this set. Right? A product over a certain set of expressions like this can be decomposed into a summation over all subsets. And for each subset, we get the product of the corresponding uh, ratios xi over 1 minus xi. Um, good, but that's uh, that's equal to p to the j product of one over one over xi uh, j. I guess I'm using j here. And well. P to the j is a product of pj over the set j, which by the LLL conditions is bounded by xi times the product over neighbors of i, let's call, let's call them L. So we're almost done. Now we have these two products of 1 minus xj in the numerator and in the denominator. Just have to check that everything will cancel except for, um, sorry, this was over the neighborhood not including x i itself. So everything will cancel except 1 minus xi for each element of j will stay, because these are non-inclusive neighborhoods. These are inclusive neighborhoods. So there's also some overlapping going on that you have to check it's, it goes the right way. But this is upper bounded by the product of xi over 1 minus xi over uh, the elements of j. So this proves the inductive step. All we did was this trick rearranging the sum of products as a product of sums, and that's what, uh, that's what makes the induction work. 
Um, good, so I think I should uh, wrap up. From here, using again the same trick, you, you prove the bound that we have up there. It's the same formula one more time. And you take even all these subsets, and maybe some of these subsets are not. Exactly, exactly. So we are losing quite a bit in this argument, which intuitively is exactly the difference between the LLL formulation and Shearer's lemma. So when you do it properly, accounting for the fact that it's only about independent sets, then you can actually do the same thing for Shearer's lemma. And that's, that's what I didn't have time to show you. But that's how we, that's how we get the actual results uh, without any slack. Uh, yeah, OK, so uh, let's see. Okay.